Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of our Understanding Class by Eric Olin Wright reading group series. Today is Thursday the 14th of July 2021 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. I've been a bit distracted the last few days with real world stuff so I've been late in getting this episode out but not to worry I'll make it up with an extra release in the coming days. This week I have the new patrons Brent Beaumont, Charsky, Will Hughes, Face Attack, Zach Rowe, Mitch Galman, Fia and Christoph Ruprecht who has upgraded to a yearly subscription to thank. If you like the sound of extra patron only episodes, hanging out with us all on the Emancipation Network Discord server or joining in the patrons Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution reading group series, why not head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollars. It keeps the books on my shelf and food on the table. Okay, let's return to our discussion of Chapter 1, From Grand Paradigm Battles to Pragmatist Realism, Towards an Integrated Class Analysis. The link to the Google Slides are, of course, in the show notes. Let's go on. We're on to class as exploitation and domination. Okay, we're going to talk about why this is its more than just exclusion. So this is getting into the idea of this continuous lived relation you know, of exploitation versus just an exclusion from a particular role, particular place. The clearances excluded peasants from land, then bringing those peasants back on the land as agricultural laborers, thus stealing the land and then exploiting and dominating the laborers. So there's like a kind of a the initial sin here of like stealing the land and then this ongoing exploitation relation. Yeah, this is a stronger form of relational interdependency than simple exclusion, you know, because it, it lives forever. It's like, you know, if if my great grandfather got like his car stolen, it wouldn't affect me, you know. But if the land was gone <laughs> and I had to work on the land, I'd be screwed. You know, the ongoing relationship between the activities of the advantaged and disadvantaged persons, not just a relationship between their conditions. So that that's kind of you know, bringing this temporal idea into the difference between like this idea of exclusion versus this ongoing work relationship. And finally, exploitation and domination are forms of structured inequality that require continual active cooperation between both the exploiters and the exploited, the dominators and the dominated. And this is getting into what we've just been talking about, this relationship that's ongoing relation between the exploiter and the exploiter the dominator and the dominator having this kind of weird which i cannot say the d words now i can say this like weird relational interchange how about that yeah well, <laughs> what, what's uh what's a uh, wolf's uh what's wolf's code word for dialectical over determined determination it's oh. over determined relationship that, that's, 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 that's Altusser. That's Altusser, and Wolf is trying to hide his Altusserianism. Also, like, yeah, it's not. I hate the way Altusser ruined the, ter- the term "overdetermined" because it's actually really useful in logical yeah. analysis. I think. I think actually, Tom, you're actually. This is interesting that you're onto something here, because domination is is actually even in Marxism, the beginning step. So, look, if you like the clearances for excluded peasants from the land. That's a domination move. You can only do that by physical force. But what makes right. capitalism different from other attempts of doing it, like the reason why the English settler colonies did things differently than the Spanish settler colonies is the, the step of free labor turning into exploitation, even if it's based off of, quote, primitive accumulation, unquote. And I use that quotations because I think if you actually read the German, I'm not actually disputing primitive accumulation, but if you actually read the German, it means something more like so-called primal accumulation, our yeah, original like accumulation. Pr- primary or or, yeah. or some, yeah. Yeah, so like, like, it, so like yeah. yeah. It doesn't mean like primitive happens a long time ago and only happens to in this early stage of development, which is, I think, wrong. Like, it's Marx, a wrong way to understand this. Marx says Thomas Aquinas and original sin. Is that what we're saying? I kind actually on this kind of yeah the the, yeah. This is the original form of proprietarianism is I take this shit from you and I got guns what you gonna do about it? I, I actually like the the phrase primary accumulation. It's better. It's not doesn't have this dumb like kind of colonial 
tinge to it that when I'm reading, when we did in capital reading group with Precious and she winced every single time the word like primitive was used. You know, I think it's a, a bad word. We should kind of excoriate it out of Marx. Not what the German means anyway, so. Cancel the word. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Political correctness, yes. <laughs> this continuous relation of exploitation, this uh, continual act of cooperation between explorers and exploited dominators and dominated, I think is like something that really comes up in the simple reproduction section in, in volume one. And this is like, I feel like this is a thing that so many people don't take away from reading Capital. Like they still maintain this uh, very uh, distributionist understanding of class struggle after reading it. Like they don't, it doesn't stick that like, yeah, this is in a very, like in a very real sense, an activity is something that is ongoing and it's relational. It's not just rich people are rich, let's take their stuff problem solved, which is so many people's idea of class struggle and which is only really meaningful within the context of the first theory of class that we've discussed. Yeah, maybe um, because, the second, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess it depends on like how enduring the forms of capture are because like there are definitely cases where the, the form of capture is enduring past any kind of a uh, seizure of property, right? Yeah, to, to me, this is what why, why mere distributionary stuff is always uh, a non-starter because I redistribute, if I redistribute things within the same current system without changing the way we actually produce them, what have I done? I've changed. I've changed the people most likely to become the next dominant ruling class, and that's it. It's the it's the Sumerian kings canceling the debt every fifty years. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. It, 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 like it, like actually, it saves capital from certain crises that it would develop otherwise, or even proto capital in the case of the Sumerian king. But like it, it doesn't change much. So this is this is one of these things where. Where like I'm not totally hostile to MMT more. Jar has made the point on primitive accumulation. Also, this is why why Mar Marx actually uses the German phrase for so-called directly in front of it when he mentions it. I will also say that the the distributionist form of uh, class struggle that you're talking about there, Derek, it's it you know just to put this completely in the cultural gutter. This it just reminds me of Thanos in Avengers Endgame. Is like I'm gonna kill half the people. Overpopulation solved forever. My job <laughs> here is done. Like having no systems understanding at all. Oh, just, yeah. just fucking. Oh yeah, there we go. Done it. Solved the problem. But yeah, it's like a, it's like Thanos for debt. That's what a, ju a jubilee is like. Speaking of Thomas Aquinas and, and Catholics, the, uh, the you know that the Christian brothers, the founder, of the Christian brothers, are trying to make him a uh, they're trying to make him a saint. I think they made him a saint under the old dude Ratzinger or whatever. Uh, he just basically went out and fucking made everybody a goddamn saint. But he, you know they have to have a certain number of uh, miracles before you can be made a saint under the Catholic Church. So basically, what they do is they just start making up these miracles. And I think the Christian Brotherhood, you know, they one of the miracles, I think you need three to be a saint, you need two to be canonized. There's all this like kind of stuff. But one of them was that he did the, the miracle of bilocation, that like somebody saw him in Wexford Town and really somebody else saw him in like New Ross at the same time. <laughs> they just, oh man, fucking hilarious Catholics, man. You gotta love them. Are we good here? Let's move it on. There's a couple of comments in the chat. They're wondering what the original... German was for uh, primitive. It was Ursprünglich, I guess, or, which means original initial. Okay, yeah, that's... although to, to be fair, Finally. like yeah. Jar is right that the the word that Smith uses is, is primitive, primitive accumulation, which is why Marx uses so called, so -called. literally so called primitive accumulation in the word. And I've had people yell at me, like like post colonial post-Marxist yell at me about this for a long time, like the judgment and primitive. And I'm like, that's not, it's like one, I don't even think that's what Emmett Smith is talking about, but two, that's definitely not what Marx is talking about. Like, well, anytime we say the word primitive accumulation, we should go primitive accumulation. Yeah. That'll, yeah. Get the, yeah. that'll get it across. So, look at this. 
We've got ourselves a table. It's been too long in our reading groups that we don't have enough tables in them. This is something that I've been working hard on. So, Goddamn math nerds. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so he basically breaks down these three different ones. And so it's the approach, uh, the economic conditions, and the economic activities, and shows how some of them are non-relational, relational, and mixes of the two. So with the kind of stratification way of looking at class, he says here that in the economic conditions is not even relational. They don't talk about the economic relations. And in the economic activities, they, they say they don't even talk about it's relational, about it being relational. So then we've got our, our Weberian or our opportunity, hoard, opportunity hoarding. And it basically talks about the relations of the economic conditions, but it doesn't talk about the ongoing temporal exploitation domination in the system and finally we got marxus who is relational in both ways who would have guessed it a kind of dialectical one would be relational in all areas does that mean i have to move on yep no. time to move on no more no further table. discussion allowed no. <laughs> you know what you know what's funny about this though is like this whole system is trying to get out of being dialectical like yeah Yes, yeah, yeah. like it, it, it's it's really funny because it's just like, well, if you actually accepted that, I don't know, that there was some truth to dialectical oppositional dynamics and not and it wasn't all just Hegelian theology, then maybe you wouldn't need so many fucking tables. So I don't know about that, because we just spent a long time talking about how people have conflated all of these different things and like. There's just certain modes of reasoning that don't do a good job of specifying what they're talking about. If you allow definitions to emerge from a conversation and then turns out the conversation just has people talking past each other, it's fine to do this. It's not to get away from the relational qualities of the theory. That's the, you know, the one little like piddling ounce of respect I have for Althusser is that he was like, well, how this is some bong rip theology. How are we going to make this really scientific? Oh, I know. I'll just do a bunch of other bong rip like theology based on like a different. Like, I was going to uh, say like do worse bong rip theologies well, that have no structural cohesion to them. Well, that's that's the thing about Althusser is that he starts from this sort of reasonable place and just gets worse and worse. Whereas like the analytics kind of are trying to do, especially the ones that are coming out of Althusserian tradition like Cohen and Wright you know, that's, that's their kind of common heritage is, you know, like actually spelling out what the terms of these theories are. I don't know. I, I think in a way the dialectics they're trying to destroy ultimately is the, like the state ideology aspect of this. There are kind of analytical Marxists that want to destroy, you know, like emergent properties or whatever, but they lose, they lose the methodological debate in the broad, in the long run even if they, you know, convince some of the smarter analytical Marxists in the 80s. Well, I was about to, I was about to say, um, unfortunately, Esri, there are no analytical Marxists left, so... so should there... I start a blog called The Last Analytical Marxist? <laughs> yes, maybe. <laughs> because, yeah. uh, because yeah. I mean, in, in some sense, like, even E.O. Wright, once we get to the end of this book, we're going to have to deal with the fact that, like, the opposition to analytics means he basically doesn't have a value theory. And this is why I was yelling at Tom earlier, because he, he floats through different ones and they don't work together. And you like it's you basically have to start like, well, in this part of the economy, we operate under this value system. And in this part of the comp comp no, economy, we operate under this. Don't even start this. Don't even start. <laughs> no, 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 start no, 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 me. This is not on you. This is what I this I actually think like this book, once we get to later chapters, leads itself to that kind of thinking because like he can't defend labor theory of value without dialectics. You know, it like when you when you look at these tables of relation and non-relational and you try and shoehorn this massively relational system with feedback loops all over the place, it's kind of like it reminds me of, you know, like Conway's Game of Life, where you have these yes. extraordinarily simple rules and you put them in. And these massively complex behaviors that are essentially totally unpredictable, like, but you can see them at other higher layers of interaction, having their own logics or, and reflecting back to, on themselves that are completely non-obvious. And I think that yes. basic insight is the problem with trying to shoehorn everything into this analytical framework that there will be emergent stuff and 
you know, but that does not mean I agree with Esri that we can't use the analytical toolbox where it is useful because we can certainly see that we've we've used it so far in this to look at the deep core problems with some of these analysis people are making. So basically, we have a meta dialectical problem where we need to put dialectics against analytics and a dialectical methodology, which makes us go oh, through oh, the analytic oh, sublation to, oh, to, 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 do, oh, to do a bunch of charts. Oh, oh, I would agree with most oh, we're of that. Yes, baby, we're on the next slide. Yes, baby, we're on the next slide. Except oh, for the word methodology, good. I would agree with that. <laughs> Oh, that was excellent. We're, wow. we're in the greater logic now, folks. I, I, honestly, I'm spent. I don't know if I'm going to be able for a second slide. <laughs> we're almost done with this little bit of the section. We're okay, so I'm only joking. We're Let, so let's close. go. So, so we have a, we have on this slide a, a class as exploitation and domination. So do we have our, our graph, our lovely little diagram here that we have to try and talk about some of the exploitation and domination kind of process through time, I think. We have our power relations and legal rules that give people effective control over economic resources. So that's kind of like our, our superstructure, but also kind of like the initial, it looks like kind of like the initial Weberian, we've got the enclosure here. Then we have, I don't know, power relations. No, that's the power relations. Then we have social closure and opportunity hoarding among social positions. And then we have locations within the relations of domination and exploitation and production. And then finally, we have conflict over production. Whew. I So let's break this down. The first one he's saying here is, is, is this talking about our, our, our initial original sin and our superstructure that which essentially enforces this original sin? Yeah. It's the base and the superstructure. It's power relations and legal rules. Power relations themselves are the structuring things that are like underneath the legal rule. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I would actually, I would say that power relations emerges from before law. I also say this is why the base superstructure metaphor doesn't, I think it's actually correct, but me, people ignore the Marx talks about it as a feedback loop like explicitly that it's that one is informing the other morphing into the other informing the other until in the final instance the base dominates whatever the hell that means instead of like everything is emergent from the base and everything that's superstructural is unimportant because legal rules really matter for class they absolutely do they matter for ownership they matter for when the state can shoot you about taking property and when it yeah. can't you know it's kind of a big deal Okay, so the so the next one here is social closure and opportunity hoarding among social positions. Now, what is he getting at here, Esri? Well, what he's getting at is that this is the special case of the general Weberian case. It's specifically social closure over social positions based on power relations and legal property law. So like... Getting your degree, getting your whatever, well, accreditation... I, I, at this point, I think he's actually talking about the ability to own property specifically. Yeah, it's literally just like who has ownership rights. And then what, yes. what do those ownership rights afford? Right. So like the other kinds of opportunity hoarding would be covered in the Weberian classes opportunity hoarding model. Whereas this is more specifically like this is all the setup for capitalism. I, it it always kind of blew my mind that there was the whole like John Romer side of analytical Marxism that was all about distribution in this really like mathematically kind of like worked out way. Because for me, the big revelation for Marxist economics was that all of that distribution shit and, you know, thinking about distributional justice and all and all this stuff didn't really consider, you know, the initial setting of the game initial setting of the table in primary accumulation. And there's a whole debate in analytical philosophy going back and forth between John Rawls and Robert Nozick about whether, you know, capitalism is just. And then eventually the libertarian capitalist, Robert Nozick, gets put on the fence and says, well, you know, 
it's it would all be just if the initial setup for capitalism was just which if they know anything about the initial setup for capitalism <laughs> yeah. um it has to be bracketed out in order to make capitalism have its own standards of justice that don't violate the society that don't destroy the society by trying to consider them like there's the you know the whole marxist notion of capital exploiting justly and justice being a, a term that is totally relative it all dwells in the process in the first two bits of this graph. And then when you're looking at the locations within domination, exploitation and conflict over production, you know, most people locked into capitalism. I, I mean, maybe this is a little different today, but I think in general, this is true. Most people just don't have the first two in their purview. That, like that's like the first two things here, the power relations and legal rules and then the social closure and opportunity hoarding among social positions with those property rules. Like what's being talked about here is the opportunity to employ people because you own, you own stuff. Like that's the, that's the social closure and opportunity hoarding among social positions is if you don't, you know, own a big swath of land, you know, you can't hire people to work on your land. <laughs> you can't have that role. I mean, it sounds even kind of silly to talk about it in terms of social closure because the, you just don't have the thing to employ people with. But it is. Well, it, it yeah, counts. exactly. It's like people don't even it, like the capitalist ideology is so entrenched that it seems weird to even talk about ownership as social closure when it's like actually if you step back and think for a second, it's kind of like, oh no, obviously that is, that's what it is. <laughs> well, and that's also why capitalists do this thing where they redefine what capital is and what, you know, I was reading Mandel's, uh, Ernest Mandel's short introduction to Marxism and Marxist economics. It was like a hundred pages. I, it's super orthodox in ways that aren't totally defensible, but I think I think people should read it to like get what, like what Marxists used to think Mandel's also very good on like understanding the Aristotelian and Hegelian stuff and Marx, and that's all over the place. But the the power relations, he he makes this sly observation that capitalists keep on redefining capital from what they meant about it in the, classically, so that like the first the way they define on capital is the first monkey who grabbed a banana is actually the first capitalist. Um, the reason why they do that is because it naturalizes away step one and two which is uh, Mandel's point with that. Yeah, absolutely. It's the, it's the Robinson Crusoe critique in, in volume one. What, what, what I really like about this graph is how it ends up with the final one is conflict over production. And I think that is the logic of capital. That's where you're going to get your... It's, it's weird. Like when we, we see today, all the, the left stuff is about distribution, you know? But if we look at where does the conflict in the system naturally occur... It really occurs in production. It doesn't so much occur in distribution. I don't know what people think about that. No, there's they're both true. Yeah, there's a sort of language game that comes up here in that distribution never talks about the distribution of the means of production. It only talks about distribution of the fruits of Correct. the means of production. And like, it's this very ideological notion of distribution. Because, yeah, if you talked about distribution of, you know, means of production, then, you know, problem solved. But that's not what Marx is talking about when he's talking about, you know, uh, the utopia of exchange and Bentham and whatever and, and capital, you know, after after getting through all this horrific, all this horrific stuff about production. And then, yeah, you know, let's talk about exchange. You know, exchange, it's fair. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, you... I was just going to say, like, you're right, Tom, where, like, Conflict over production is the logical point of origination, but uh, of course, distributionary conflicts, you know, like, oh, let's just say something like IP law causing millions upon millions of people to go without access to vaccination is also relevant yep. to, to, to lived conflict. Never, never uh, going to happen. Never going to happen. Never going to happen. <laughs> But I believe there is a passage where Marx talks about this and he talks about production predominating over itself in the antithetical definition of production, uh, which is just that 
you have production in like that kind of very basic sense, but then you also have production in this way that we're talking about here as like the logical origination point of conflict that is like more than just simply making stuff. It's like what the relations involved in that engender in the whole capitalist system. Now, more on class and exploitation of domination. Okay. He says here that the central division in a capitalist society is between those who own and control the means of production in the economy and those who are hired to use the means of production. So the capitalists and the workers. Other positions within the class structure get their specific character from their relationship to this basic structure. You know, so like your role as a manager or PMC, whatever the hell, God damn it, you know, or a lawyer or whatever it is, it's based within that general core relation between the owners and the non-owned workers. Managers exercise many of the powers of domination, but are also subordinate to capitalists. CEOs and top managers often develop significant ownership stakes, this is going to Derek's point, and therefore become like capitalists. Yep, but they even do this. Stock. Yeah, but they even do this. Like when I worked in uh, the bank and I worked in Ericsson, you know, doing IT jobs, you would get actually shares every year. It was this oh, idea, yeah. you know, like kind of a neoliberal idea of giving people small amounts of shares to give them like, you know, feel like they're a part of the firm. And so they'll... The feel... ownership society. Exactly. Yeah. When you know, I worked so, for Lowe's, they gave me, sh- I mean, even as a lowly stock worker, they actually gave me like one one hundredth of a share for like working there. And it actually, that's why I was so critical of co-ops as the answer to capitalism, because I'm like, I know a lot of corporations that let all employees technically own a share so that we'll, so that we will export ourselves more to increase our stock value. <laughs> Like back in like 2000, I was working in Ericsson and before the bubble burst, like the shares, I, I, you could you could double up the amount of shares you get from your wages. You could take your Christmas bonus as shares. So I did. And like then in 2001, the shares dropped from, I think it was 230 SEK. So it was like 23 pounds or like $30 a share to like 30 cents a share. It dropped by 99%. So all my like my Christmas bonus for a few years, it just got uh, like, I mean, th- I still have the shares. Oh. They're, they're floating around somewhere. I haven't looked at them in 20 <laughs> years, uh, but I've never gone near them. But I literally had like a few thousand dollars worth of shares that lost 99, literally 99% of their value. Okay. And um, highly educated professionals and some technical workers have, have sufficient control over knowledge and skills that they can maintain considerable autonomy from domination and even exploitation. This is going to your point earlier, Kyle. This is something I personally experienced working in, say, when I worked for Ericsson and the bank. Like when you work with these, like as a kind of a a skilled worker in these businesses where they are essentially like massive monopolies, like in, say, European telecoms, there was like, there was essentially two or three suppliers and they just got... They didn't have much competition between each other. They had they could massive amount of these huge contracts. There was a little competition. It was like cartel. And, you know, we used to do nearly no work, nearly no work. Like you, people used to go in, take a sick day every week. No one would say anything because they had they would they literally would sit there in Ireland, Ericsson, and suck on the teeth of like the state telephone company and just uh. sell them hundreds of millions. They were I so hate inefficient. The more and more, the more you talk. I'm just like, why? Why aren't you exploited appropriately? No, seriously. Um. <laughs> I used, we, we used to get. Listen to this. We used to get like a half day every Friday, right? And most of the time, it was in the dot com boom. When on a Thursday evening, our boss would have a uh, had have a credit card, and he put it behind the bar, and we'd all get so smashed that we wouldn't be able to make it into work until maybe half eleven on a Friday, and then we'd leave at one o'clock. Like that was the regime. See, and in the- you're describing socialism for me. This is what I think socialism is. We all get to work for three hours and get smashed at one o'clock on a Friday. No, um, <laughs> that's literally so. Like my father was always asking me, "And do you not have to clock in?" I was like, "No, man, <laughs> you're you're joking." Like you, you know, know what- so. You know what's interesting about that, though, as a teacher, I don't have to clock in either. But because if we actually clocked in all the work I did, they'd have to pay me for it. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah. Um, oh and, yeah. Oh, that's that's a big part of being a teacher. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I, I figured out. I there are some weeks I work up to sixty hours. I mean, so like, it's and that's before I do this shit with you guys. Um, my 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 last teaching job is working ninety hours a week. Jesus. So I mean. Uh, one thing I'm interested in this because I, I buy Tom particularly when monopoly capital sectors and I think monopoly capital has like a bunch of different meanings even in Marxism but specifically in areas where the state grants a monopoly licensure you're completely right. There's also these weird quasi areas where there's where there's legal protections that create. I mean, tenured professorates is one of those where it's like I like I, you know I have a hard time crying over the the struggles of a tenured professor ever. Because I know, like, even the works that's published under their name, half of it's done by grad by graduate right. student indentured servitude, and like the entire thing. Like, and you know, I used to teach an eight eight load, and listening to them complain about a three two load for those who don't like three classes in a in a semester and two classes the next because they have to do like one research paper a year. It just makes me, you know, like like I get why working class people hate them. Like, like I I do actually. And their relationship to even what class structure they're in is weird. Like, it, it is quite strange. But I would not say they completely get out of exploitation. I would say they get, like, they're minimally exploited. But they're, if they weren't exploited some, that was my point even about the oil workers, there would be no, there would be no profitability in it. Because they could just do it themselves. So I, I do find that interesting. And I find... I also find the fact that we're in an age where a lot of these, like one of the attractions of the PMC thesis that is perverse to me is one of the things that people are, are angry about is the overproduction of elites, right? But they're also, they're also angry about the fact that all these people are being forced into more and more spheres of life. So you have all these educated people. And so they're mad that these people want what exactly because they're, they're being mad told. that people are, are being educated yeah they're mad that people are being educated and that they're pro Seriously. like how, how dare you how dare you bring intelligence to our proletarianized fields and want us to like not just be groveling and and it's funny because it's it's funny because they're literally complaining about something all the working class families i know really fought for like if you were a working class family with sense, you fought to have your kids educated, and the last generation was the yeah. first I mean, was the first generation where a lot of us were, because it was like what my my dad used to tell me, like you know you know he was a my stepdad was a mechanic, and he'd be like, there's not going to be enough jobs for you if you stay and you like try to do shit work with your hands. You have to go get educated, even if you want to do this. And he was right, and now those jobs are disappearing yeah. too, because you know. It reminds me of of when I like when I went to college in in Trinity in Dublin because Trinity what well, used to be like you used to get excommunicated up into the seventies in Ireland you'd be excommunicated from the Catholic Church if you went to Trinity because it was like a Protestant yeah. college so it was only like in the mid seventies but like the, most of the so it was in the nineties like all of the professors that the ones that were Irish nearly all of them were essentially had English accents because they were all like landed Protestant gentry. And I always got the feeling all, of them that they were like, you know, these are the unwashed coming in here <laughs> with their actual <laughs> Irish accents. Seriously, swear to God, yeah. I felt, and I feel yeah. like there's a similar dynamic with this idea of like, you know, we cannot have baristas understanding, you know, Deleuze. You know, this is not right. <laughs> you know, and I think that's a lot of it. People actually just want to be an elite yeah, I mean, I guess the, the thing that we didn't mention about the PMC stuff is that a lot of the people who articulate this are from the background they're complaining about. All of them. Every yeah, I haven't found I've, one who wasn't. I've, I've met one on the internet, and they made a big deal about it, and they didn't seem to the mind. The rarest Pokemon. I know. I found, I found, I found him. You know, he, he didn't seem to mind that everyone else that he's boosting is from that, and then he also didn't seem to mind that. Uh, Turchin, a uh, Peter Turchin, where a lot of the PMC elite, you know, the PMC uh, politico, like anti politico, whatever, get their quote class theory from, believes that you need a, basically a middle strata to make any political counter movement. You need counter elites 
to capture that momentum and, and create a socially Your stratified society. That, that you should treat the working class like you treat a natural resource, that it doesn't act on its own accord ever. Like, right, or, like, or it does It does act on its own accord, but it doesn't matter unless counter elites get involved. Right. Like, it, yeah. it doesn't, ha- it, you can't, like, cohere into a new society. That was That's also, the like, Burnham's thing about the managerial elites is that you had to just pick which form of management you were going to accept. Right. We should, we should say James Burnham, not, you know, anti managerial, just thought mm-hmm. that this was a new fact of life and you had to pick one. I was just going to say, I think, I think that a big part of that, that like the reason why the PMC thesis has purchased and especially among the PMC themselves is the explosion of like the bureaucratic managerial nature of society under the neoliberal era, where basically like over-educated bureaucrats are being brought in above the the heads of the people who are actually doing the work and basically making everybody's lives a living hell through like the the overcapture of information and like the expansion of the amount of work that you have to do to like satisfy these these quantitative targets. I think that plays a huge part in like why that that feel that kind of like I said before that has that kind of crunchy truthiness to it because like a lot of for for a lot of people like dealing with an educated person means dealing with a bureaucrat who's going to make you do garbage work for no reason. Well, you know what's interesting about that happening under neoliberalism, though, because a lot of people think neoliberalism is really ordo liberalism, and it's just like, like it just means that we have a laissez faire free market and historical entrepreneurs, and and and, 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 and like the the one th- and he's not a Marxist, but the one theorist I think really understands this. He wrote "Crisis is a Terrible Thing to Race." Uh, what's his name? I interviewed him. Murkowski? Yeah, Murkowski. That neoliberalism actually really depends on the state to construct more and more micro, basically captured markets that have privileged access to create the appearance of profitability. Now, he doesn't think profitability is a problem the same way Marxists do, but like, I think that's exactly what's going on. And, and that's why there's this bureaucratic explosion because these hyper-managed, really access-limited markets are also pretty strictly regulated as regimes of law. And this is also one of the reasons why I think we have to stand against a lot of like our liberal allegiances who thinks that we can fix all this through regulation because that's actually what's driving a lot of this cost disease and resentment. It's getting people within the state to get yourself legal rights towards the ability to get yourself a higher surplus rate of return. You know, there's loads of mechanisms, I think, going on like that. When the profitability in the in the general economy is not good, you're going to get people battling over the right to get, get that little super profit. There's one last one in this that didn't fit on that last slide. I don't know if we've kind of done it already, but it's just saying that in both hoarding and the exploitation domination approaches, Inequalities in income are sustained by the exercise of power, not simply by the act actions of individuals. So that's just Weber and the Marx kicking these stratification dudes in the face. That's essentially what we're saying here. <laughs> yes. Now, yeah, ha, ha, this is where we start getting into the weird, oh, the weird, increasingly yeah. complex. <laughs> I don't know. I do not know how how this is going to work on a podcast. <laughs> Let's get this straight. Can we make this into a choose your own adventure? Yeah. This is yeah. Dragons be here. Okay. Now. Well, and one. also this is a little simplified because you're also missing yes. the, the causal effects versus the flow of people. Explain what you mean here, Tiberius. So, so in that center column of three locations within relations, market relations, class relevant attributes, like, those up arrows there are actually flows of people, and the rest of the arrows are causal relationships. That's yes. true. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Then let's just, I think the only way we can deal with discussing this so that it would be intelligible to anybody who's going to listen to it is to kind of talk about maybe the last kind of box. I don't know what people think. Because we've talked about a lot of these actual processes before. We've talked, I'm with you know. You through them. Yeah. So like the That's general true. gist is if we look if we line up all these models kind of alongside each other we see that the stratification ends up with things being cited on the individual 
for the Viberian, we have conflicts over distribution. And in Marxian, we got the conflicts over production. The only thing As, I'd say is in the Viberian, conflicts over distribution also also include conflicts over the distribution of the ability to produce. Like that's so mm -hmm. that's our, that's, that's where the topology of this thing gets really strange. Yeah. Like you know, if we were to draw this diagram here, like for people who are listening and who you know don't aren't looking at the slides, we we have like nine box and a load of arrows, right? But really, most most boxes have like maybe one arrow coming in and one or two maybe going out. But in reality, what we should have here is these nine boxes and each one with an arrow to each other one. So we should probably have like you know. What would that be? N factorial or something? Well, well you know what I was. You know, what I mean, I we're missing say. like three or four dimensions of this analysis here. So, well, we're, yeah. we're missing, we need to be getting into hyperspace in order to properly like visualize this. Hyperspace. We're missing the arrows that go from conflict over production to conflict over distribution that feed back onto power relations and legal roles that come in on uh, one point five. Which is really funny because when I was looking at this, I'm like, damn, this is a complex diagram. Then you turn the page and there's an additional level of feedback complexity. But yeah. I think I think we could do this on a podcast by starting with the right box and then and then going. Okay, for instance, Marxian, conflict over production, is caused by locations within the relations of domination and exploitation in production which has flows of people from locations within market relations, jobs, occupations. But the, the domination and exploitation relations in production and those locations are caused by social enclosure, opportunity horizon, caused by uh, legal rules, power relations that give people effective control. We could, we could feed back like that. We Except could feed back like do, that. The stratification one, which <laughs> feeds back in every direction. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what yeah. I said. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's going to be particularly what we should do is basically I think say to people to look at this goddamn slide after listening to yeah or make it the cover art yeah right? yeah nobody uh, looks at the goddamn cover art and and depending uh, on like what app you're using you don't see the cover art yes, anyway. that's right. I don't see that's the cover right. art on pod kicker I would say two cybernetic points here this medium that we are using to convey the information does not have sufficient variety <laughs> to convey the text which is within each of these as well as their relations to one another. The second one is, I was uh, actually listening to an interview with uh, Nora Bateson and she was talking about, she was talking about cybernetics and where she thought that systems theory and cybernetics had kind of gone wrong. And one thing that she said is that nowhere in life are you going to find boxes with arrows that connect them uh, in the real world. And we need to be focused more on the relations between things and less these like simplified arrow and box systems, which are like the fetish of all systems practitioners. So just a cautionary thing to recognize the limitations of this form of graphical representation. And this is actually a thing that, that Stafford Beer always would mention is that like he was never satisfied with the viable system model because it never had enough representational power to convey the systems in which it was trying to be applied. So it's, it's just, I don't know. There's like, there's all these kinds of like representational problems that we're going to run into with this. But all that being said, I do think the next chart is like pretty clear at making its point, even if this one isn't. Yeah, let let maybe let's head on to that. I I fully concur with your with all of those points. I think it's absolutely right. And but part of me is saying, but like, but Kyle, they would have never designed NetHack if you had that logic. <laughs> you know, so so screw you, Net Kyle. Screw cybernetics. I want my NetHack. NetHack is a beautiful thing. Uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna attack NetHack. Okay, um, are we good to go on to the next bit? Do people or do people want to yeah, talk about this thing? Yeah, let's do. Let's no, go that's on. fine. Okay, so here's 
him saying what the problems with this model is, so kind of getting towards what we have been here saying a little bit. This treats power relations and legal rules as exogenous structures given to us from the alien overlords, no doubt. These basic power relations are themselves shaped by class processes. So this is this idea of feedback. Structures of inequality are dynamic systems. You know, again, I think similar feedback point. And the fate of individuals depend not just on micro level processes they encounter in their lives or on the social structures within which those take place, but on the trajectory of the system as a whole within which these micro processes occur. Like, Where you were born in a business cycle really matters. Exactly. Yeah. The falling rate of yeah. profit's going to bite your ass. Well, you we know? just we just had this discussion in uh, the GIU uh, Stafford Beer Reading Group yesterday where people were, where we were talking about like intergenerational struggle. And I was like, well, like just basically making this point, like where you're born in a business cycle or where you're born on the trajectory of the parade of profit has a really big effect on how your generation quote unquote experiences the world. And right. it's just like, that's just, if you try to bracket that out and say like, nah, 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 for the purposes of solidarity, let's ignore all that. You're just being no. an idealist. Like yeah. I was actually thinking about this in terms of America, why why class politics in America seems so dominant is like, think about what happened after World War II. I keep on bringing this mm -hmm. point up. Like we had 48% of the world's wealth and 5% of the hands of the planet. And they were able to spread it around during one generation that lasted it really only lasted from 1945 to 1962. And like those people are the fucking baby boomers. Like yep. that's who they are. And like, this is what made the PMC thing so funny to me, actually, the, the bring it back to this and the, how this applies. And the PMC just is irrational on its face. But like when they were talking about like, well, if you were to get college student debt relief, which I admit there are problems with it. We could go into that on another day. But you're you're really having six percent of the population pay for forty percent of the world's debt. But then I was like, yeah, but boomers disproportionately are the six percent that aren't educated because once you the the younger you get, the more likely you are to have a college degree. By the time you hit thirty five, it's like six percent of the population or more has had access to college and gone to college to some to some level. And that means that the boomers who don't have college educations are disproportionately better off even then their projected future status is for some of the people that they're talking about with these degrees who are parts of the quote elite unquote, because of their right. relationship in the long cycle of capital, like where you are in a quandrev cycle, not even a short business cycle. So like, it's an idiotic argument to not take the broad spectrum of the last hundred years into account. And in America, that's the most extreme because we had the most accumulation at one time. Right. You know, it's, it's like when you're, you're in a plane, you're flying over like Western Europe. You're going to do the dropping the parachutes in behind enemy lines. And, you, you know, your life expectancy is determined, you know, is, is linked to are you the first or the last to jump out of that goddamn plane? You know, <laughs> are you going to be, you know, where are you going to drop? Yeah, like, let, let's look at this lovely dynamic micro macro model where he tries to put the idea of these feedback loops into the previous model we've had. So basically, he's showing how conflict of production has an arrow feeding back into the initial power relations and legal rules uh, that give people objective control over the economic resources and yeah. conflicts of distribution having that feedback. But in reality, I think there's feedbacks at all levels to all things. Yeah, I was like, it really should be that you overlap those two. That split is actually just overlapping. They're not separate. Like conflict over production, conflict over distribution. Just one's more primary than the other, and I don't know. It again, I'm gonna a second Kyle that like this is better, but it's like actually more vague than even the base superstructure model because of what it separates out where and how artificial that separation is. I mean, I, I think I think as you, we go further in the book, he'll demonstrate an awareness that this is an in reality an artificial separation, but in the theories, this is what theorists focus on essentially. Like, I mean, Weber was interested in conflicts over production because he was in the S. Pay Day. But like, as it turns out, Weberian sociology has only a sort of tenuous relationship with Max Weber, the person. 
Isn't that true with yeah. most of these things? <laughs> like you including it up to Marx. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, Marx. He's so unlike your Marxist. Um, Marx, I famously will... not a Marxist. Right. right. Keynes, I, I... Keynes, famously not a Keynesian. <laughs> yeah, Keynesianism is like Hicks, right? Like it's not even Keynes. Well, uh, there's the there's the Cambridge School and then the American uh, yes. School and yeah, no, no, it's the whole fair. it's a whole thing. Uh, anyway, I will say like this this chart can be illuminating in some things. So, for example, one tendency that happened over the 20th century was for capitalists to do salaried work, not in the sense that they became workers, but just in the sense that like, or it was, it was confusing to people and, and had a kind of propagandistic value because it actually conflated these two things, the locations within the relations of domination, exploitation, and production locations within market relations, job slash occupations. So it's like, oh, like, cause it used to be the case, like if you, entered a country and you declared your job, your occupation on the customs form or whatever, the immigration form or customs form, many people would just write capitalist as their job on the form. But that, that has become so much less clear over the course of the 20th century into the 21st century. And yeah, it's like, oh yeah, I have a position within relations of domination exploitation as an owner but i also i also draw a salary so right. i kind of have like the ethos of work and i can i can take on that persona of a worker in some way because yeah it, it, it's like things that used to be a little bit more conceptually and positionally separated uh have become more conflated and yeah. it doesn't mean that like this in the abstract does not hold, but it does kind of screw with people's understanding because their theory is a little bit more bifurcated than reality is. Right. Now, see also owning a house with a bank loan is somehow treated as owning productive capital in the clear. Yeah. But no, but this is this is why you do simplify things and why you do like conceptual surgery on phenomena that appear to you together. That's a, mm -hmm. actually sort of a virtue of the, you know, analytical kind of aspect is to carve things up. It's just that you got to remember that that's what you're doing. And for the reasons that Kyle said, even like as capitalism becomes more complex and we enter, you know, the glorious higher stage of full capitalism, it's like relations between market locations and relations, locations within relations of domination, exploitation, production, you know, they really like are much more it's much more diffuse it's a lot less one-to-one -one. you can't write yeah. capitalist as your job you know like worker as your you know i don't know no one i don't wrote, know this makes me want to go full like classical frankfurt school and just start screaming about totality to the high heaven even though i know that's not necessarily <laughs> like <laughs> helpful because well, be because yeah. like the tendency to cut isn't of itself a choice and if you study classical economic like current neoclassical economics they hide so much shit in the cuttery. Some ways I cannot think that it that it is not deliberate because they'll like have I agree. two or more parsimonious assumptions that are one of which is like capitalism is always rational because rational is whatever we say it is. Because we have two tautological definitions hidden in our parsimonious chart here. They were um, the shit as well, Derek. <laughs> I, I guess the, the question is, is this a problem with the activity of cutting, or is that a problem with the specific cuts being made in neoclassical economics? I would argue the, the latter. The, the, I would argue that the activity of cutting necessitates hiding. Well, you know, I would agree with that. Well, that's the that's purpose it. of doing the cutting. Yes, that's absolutely. Oh shit! It's Heidegger. Every <laughs> revealing is also a concealing. <laughs> yes, but abstraction is good if you want to understand a complex social system. That's you can't abstract. You can't fit it in your brain because you're not like uh, because you're one not the you know AI from the end of history. One can never understand the totality without artificially carving it up, right? But that no. doesn't mean 
you have to move straight back to the relations after you carve from the abstractions and look at the individual mm -hmm. component and then look at the relation. That's what Marx is doing in right. capital. Like he, he breaks down into separate individual bits and builds out from there. But like what you find in, econ in neoclassical stuff is that there's just huge amounts of ideological abstraction and ignoring and never talking about the relation, you know, and it yeah, can't be anything but a, 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 an ideological move. Or like literally defining the relation to where it is, where it is irrelevant. Like rationality is defined as whatever people do, because what you do is definitionally rational. Yeah. Just, just pure like, tautologies, tautologies that don't look at the root cause or anything, you know? Right. I mean, and yeah. I, I do think like in this sense, abstraction is necessary. Also like, Hegelian dialectus is not guilty of non abstractification. Like, it's not like, it's not like, <laughs> it's not like if you read Science of Logic, you don't get abstractions. In fact, if anything, it's worse. But yes. the problem that I have here is that you do have to have a kind of critical relationship to your own methodology that I think E.O. Wright, which is why I still respect him, he's one of the analytical Marxists that I wouldn't send to the gulag, attempts to have by yeah. constantly undermining his own models. Because yeah. he does in this book. Like he's constantly undermining his own models. Whereas a lot of the, the, the analytic Marxists, they don't. And they get they become more and more just standard neoclassical economistic people over time because of it. Yeah. They're essentially within analytical Marxism, there was a sort of struggle between the emergentist sort of school in various ways. There's not really, a, you know, it's not really a school, but it's like a tendency. And then what was called rational choice Marxism, which was much more hyper fixated on using game theory. And not that that's a problem. The problem is, is that they only wanted to talk about individuals without being able to scale up. It was methodological individualism in the extremists. Yeah, Elster and Romer to the point where later on in, in Jan Elster's career, he has to admit, after he's a Marxist, of course, uh, he has to admit that you actually can't do this. <laughs> and so while within analytical Marxism at the time, the methodological individualists seemed to win, in social science as a whole, especially as I think this is related to the sort of Cold War climate of social science, as the Soviet Union became less and less of a threat, it was more and more acceptable to do emerging to social science. I actually do kind of buy that there was a political angle to that. So as social science progresses, emergence is just fucking fine because it's not associated with the doctrine of your Cold War enemy. We're so you're also, talking about a feedback loop there. A fee yeah. Another feedback loop. I also think like the, the, the fact that they, they later on started dealing with the fact that individuals can be explained in aggregate as opposed to just a hypothesized collective really does clarify things. And that's Pirowski is like kind of a dialectical, I may add, will cause his own problems way out of this problem. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to say that like that undermining you're talking about is like actually what we see him doing in the previous slide before the yeah. diagram we just looked at, which that's is, you know, that's, that's good dialectical practice. <laughs> On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. Thank you.